Hey everybody, it's Richard Harris and I am without my friend Scott Lee. I don't even know where he is. He's dialing in late if he's going to dial in at all. So everybody, um, maybe I'll give out his cell phone number and everybody can text him and shame him for not coming to the podcast. Um, but I am here with someone who's actually more important than myself or Scott, which is Kyle York. Uh, Kyle is the co-founder and CEO of York IE, which I'll let him explain in a minute. But um, one of the things we're definitely going to get into is, is he built a company many years ago and then sold it to Oracle, which I, I'm fascinated by, you know, what's it like? Like, it's, it's sort of the ultimate dream, right? Like, let me get swallowed by the whale. And then all of a sudden you kind of go, oh, wait, I'm inside a whale. And is it good, bad, or otherwise, or a little bit of everything? So Kyle, um, thank you. Oh, even before that, shout out to our sponsors of Lead411, Find them, um, Gong.io, Perception, Predict, and Vidyard. We appreciate everybody who supports us on this podcast and we love their tools and services. So please check them out. Kyle, thanks for bearing through that long intro. Uh, welcome. We appreciate it. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so just for some context, right? Like explain a little bit about what York is so people understand where some of your perspectives are coming from. And then we're going to dive in a little bit into your history and, and life. Yeah, sure. So York IE is a new firm we launched just about 12 months ago. We call it a vertically integrated investment firm powered by market data and analytics focused on growth, go to market and strategy. So most technology companies are founded by engineers and technical founders and CEOs and CTOs. Uh, and most of the time they don't have uh, chief revenue officers or heads of sales or CMOs at the outset of building their companies. So we've built a purpose-built modern spin on early stage venture that we think provides a lot of value uh, helping these companies okay, you know, focus on that early but, on. But now, yeah. now you're going to get the full Richard. What does that even mean? Like, tell me what the, give me the yeah. use case or the pain, right? Like I heard the part about so many are founded by technical people who may not necessarily okay. have the business acumen. Maybe that's what I heard. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, honestly, my entire career has been, I've been hired, you know, I've worked for two SaaS companies and my company got acquired by Oracle. So I've worked for basically two companies in my career and there were technical founders and I was brought on to help build go to market. Right. So I basically built a firm that I thought could help early stage companies instead of working and choosing one new company to go join, to build their go to market. Could we work across the portfolio and help these companies accelerate their go to market uh, efforts the way we so, do it yeah so so what stage are you so are you like hey i want the kid in the college dorm room who's you know coming out of that or is it like no we kind of need somebody after seed or series a and then we come and accelerate we invest pre-seed through series a and it just depends i mean the, the misnomer that all early stage startups are founded by a kid in the college dorm room is also wrong the average sure. age of our founders is about 48 years old uh so yeah. you know okay. they, it's typically folks with a lot of experience um you know i think when you think entrepreneurship most of the time you do think the 20 something there's nothing to risk uh but most of the time their companies these companies are founded by really smart technologists or really smart business executives who want to take a go at building their own early stage startup and being in control of their destiny so you know it's it's kind of across the board the way we support these startups is um we built a investment syndicate so we have high net worth individuals and family offices who become investment partners with us. And unlike a typical venture fund, we haven't raised a big pile of cash. We get a five-year commit and annual pledge and we don't charge management fees or pass-through fees. We just take a carried interest on the gains. So our incentives are aligned with the entrepreneurs on building successful exits. And we view the entrepreneur as our customer, not the LP. Um, so we have high net worth individuals, family offices who do run money with us, but they're co-investing with our money. And we're helping sort of accelerate these companies in the early stages. We have also built a market and competitive intelligence platform called Fuel. It's a SaaS platform. Right now, it's an internal uh, alpha, meaning we use it to do research, tracking, discovery, diligence of investments. But we've also layered on uh, three service modules, uh, market product strategy, business growth strategy, and Marcom services. So very clearly, we have like, services that we can offer today either for stock or for cash retainer um, that we layer on top of the platform how do you and, and i'm going to ask this with there are two questions behind this question um, one is you know at that average age of 48 right which you yep. know at, at now at the age of 52 i feel so much better 
I still got to show, <laughs> except I'm not a technologist. Um, what are the traits you look for in someone to go, okay, this person gets it enough from a technology side and, and they're getting, they're understanding what they don't understand about the business side. So this is where we can help. So I ask in the context of that, but also you may have to answer it twice. What advice would you give that 20 something, right? That 30 something yeah. who's still trying to figure this out and say, okay, well, if that person comes to me, here's where I, I would want them to be aware of certain things, right? And yeah, so I mean- you start wherever yeah, think, you want, but I, I'm curious to that. I think, I mean, it's, it's all rooted in like self-awareness and knowing your strengths and knowing your weaknesses and building complementary uh, teams around you, whether those are full co-founders or full-time employees or advisors or board members or your parents or your wife, whoever, right? I mean, I think it's one thing that's, that makes the most successful people, as you know, are the people who know what they're good at. <laughs> and double down on that, focus on their strengths, and again, build teams around how you, them. How do you coach that person? I've worked with them. I know Scott has too. How do you coach that founder, regardless of age, where they think they know the business side, but they don't? Or do you? Or are you at that stage of I, your life where you're like, you know what, I'm not going to work with that guy or that woman. Like, I, I don't have uh, to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, we talk to like thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs, and we don't sling a check on all of them or do a consulting and right. on all of them. But we say the same thi thing every day. I mean, even doing this podcast interview or putting up the content we put on, we're trying to coach people. It's, as you know, it's hard to coach or advise people who are not coachable or advisable. So, you know, all you can do is stick true to your roots and what you know and what you believe you can coach on and what you've learned over the years. And they're either going to accept it or not. I always tell people this, like you can't advise people who don't want to be advised. And I think it's just really, really important to understand that as the person on the side that you and I are on and try right. to consult and advise for entrepreneurs or sales leaders or, or startups. Yeah. I think there is a DNA to entrepreneurship that a lot of people uh, don't have. I mean, I grew up in a family business, you know, it was a small family business, a local community business here in New Hampshire. Uh, I kind of always grew up with like, you work for what you get, you know, if you have a bad month, it's makes, makes it harder to, you know, I go on that vacation or what have you. Right. So I think that sort of business pragmatism has been a little lost in the venture capital tech game. Um, but you know, that entrepreneurial swagger and ability to iterate and adapt. What, what are those uh, things, right? Like I love that, that phrase. Out. Yeah. I loved your phrase, the DNA of entrepreneurship. Right. And believe me, there's a thousand things that could mean. What does that mean for you? And even to the context of, well, you know, this is how I grew up with it. This is how I was, it became ingrained in my DNA because it could be different for you than me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you need to have grit, you need to have resolve, you need to have perseverance, but all of that is irrelevant if you don't have a big vision and a big set of ambition of where you think you can take all that energy and bottle it up and get it to. So what I talk about a lot is I want to understand the long game. I want to understand what people are playing for 10 years from now, assuming they climb that mountain. And then I want to be able to see them build a backwards plan back to day zero of how they're going to do it. What tends to happen a lot, especially with technical entrepreneurs, engineers, is they, they think like an engineer. It's like they build towards something and they don't necessarily know what the sequential steps are going to be uh, working backwards to get there. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that tenacity, that grit, that perseverance, that resolve married with big ambition and big vision. A lot of times, by the way, you'll see like the big vision, big ambition. You'd be like, they have no damn clue how they're going to get there, right? That right. sounds awesome. You're going to boil the ocean, whatever, right? I mean, you see this especially in sa building out sales models, right? Right. The, the, or you'll see like, well, here's my game plan. I'm going to go attack the, you know, this little teeny tiny market with a vertical SaaS solution. You're like, all right, well, that's cute, but it's only a $20 million TAM, you know? Right. Like, like that's not that exciting, right? So, so it's the ones that kind of bridge both. They have an execution plan, 12, 18, 24, 36 months, but they also have big ambition that that execution plan can unlock. So that to me is the DNA of an entrepreneur. And then also just being able to adapt and evolve and iterate because it won't go, as you know, straight line, right? I mean, this interview is not going straight line. Nothing goes straight line. My right. kid just walked in. I don't know if you heard that. She's three, Evie. But it's like, that's, like, that's the way of the world, right? So I think honestly, and having worked in Oracle, and we'll segue there in a few, I mean, 
there are very clearly people who think they want to go do a startup to try to make life-changing money and get off the kind of corporate ladder climb and get out of the bureaucracy. And you can look at them right away and you can say, there's no chance, right? You're the cor you're a corporate survivor. You're going to be here for 20 more years. How do you define right? that, so, right? Because this is, I think this is the reason Scott and I get along so well. He he really does have the ability to see this bigger vision and, and then know how to execute. Whereas I'm a little bit more of the rule follower. I like my boundaries, right? But I've been able to figure out a way to be entrepreneurial too, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but there are lots of times, and I, you know, you know, I'll give Scott and I, I'll do something, it'll go well, and I'll give the same idea to Scott, and he'll blow it up 10x, right? Yeah. And I just don't have that vision. What are the things that you would advise someone on either side of that, of like, hey, Richard, well, here's a way for you to think about going bigger, or hey, Scott, here's how you help someone go bigger. Or Scott, don't get too caught up in that, right? Although he rarely does. Yeah, I, I think this is simple. It's a great question. No one's asked it that, that way, but I think you know what we call it is a market in strategy to company building, right? Most companies have product or solution or service out strategies. They think of what they're capable of and what they can execute, what they can build, uh, what use cases it can solve, and then how do we go take that out to the market? The way we look at it is we look at the established markets or unestablished markets, and we look at all the players, the competitors, the comparators, the pricing models, the go-to-market motions, and we pull that back into the product. And that's become a really nice marriage between like product, you know, company execution, which is really operational focused, to sort of strategic view without being like in the clouds and not connected to the yeah. operator view, right? So, so I, that's the way I look at it. You kind of have like market in, you have product engineering execution, service offering out. And it's really about, I mean, the best teams are the ones that smash those things together. They have like pragmatism to execution mm -hmm. and they have big vision and ambition. And I mean, even at York IE, my two partners, I mean, we, you know, if you look at like the risk reward scale, you know, I'm definitely like the riskiest guy going for the fences they've ever met. And they kind of keep me honed and honest, you know, Joe, my partner, FP&A background, corporate development strategy background, Adam Coughlin, you know, my other partner is a former journalist, you know, he, he's a, he's a content writer. He's a, he's a storyteller. He's thinking about things and like, how many reads did we get on this blog today did we grow did we grow web traffic at all did we get any new inquiries for investment like you know very very focused on the analytics of of the results of what we're doing right so again this is about all these so, complementary so products. and how would they describe you so if they, oh, they, they what's that yeah i mean they, they think i'm like um you know my, my my boss at oracle once called me a um a samurai warrior, you know, he's like, he's like, you're basically just like going to go take the mountain. And as long as you've got a sword, you know, and you have your conviction, you're going to go and get it right. Um, I don't know. I mean, you should have, we should have called them in and had them join. Right. But I mean, I think they, they've worked with me long enough. These are childhood friends, by the way, actually I met Adam in kindergarten and then we played little league. Uh, Joe's dad was our coach when we met Joe, right? right? So, and then we worked together for about 10 years at, at Oracle and Dime. So. so that, which is also really interesting because whether it's, you know, in your current world as, as, a, as a VC venture capital person or even a startup, we had a, we had a great conversation with Manny Medina of Outreach and having co-founders, right? That level of trust that can exist when it is someone you're that close to is amazing. Totally. But it can also create some other problems too. Um, just, yeah, I think. You know, how we, have we you guys have... navigated that that friendship business side, right? Because uh, it's 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 great when it works. Well, over many years, I mean, I think they came to dine in specific roles. You know, I was already there as its chief revenue officer. Joe joined as our first VP of FPNA. Adam joined as a content you know, manager, right? So, you know, in every company, when you're building a company like Dime, you know, we got that thing to hundred million of ARR, we exited to Oracle, you know, every, every, there's an executive team, right? But, and then every executive has like their people and their team that makes them successful, right? And that's not necessarily a hierarchy or an exact reporting structure. It's just like, these are the influencers and characters that make me the best I can be. Right. And that's honestly what ended up happening with Joe and Adam. And, and whether it was because we were close as friends or because we worked well together, I think it all just kind of morphed together and became pretty special. And 
actually long before we sold Dime, I think in early 15, I think we were sick of it kind of, you know, and then before we sold Dime, we actually got together at an offsite um, at a local like inn and we spent a few hours and we actually created a deck called Operation Little League. And it was literally York IE written down, right? We're just like, let's go do this someday together. Um, and here's what it will be. And here's what we think it could be, how it could be really impactful. Um, I think it really just comes down to like, you know, shared, you know, beliefs, sort of like really, really, really good communication. Uh, we definitely piss each other off. Um, I'm definitely hard on them. I, I think I, I have like, absurd ambition and i think sometimes like they're like at what costs i think that's probably what they say about me um just kind of always going for it but i feel like we've worked together so long beyond the friendship that but i think what it's, they, it's earning that trust there too that, that's really good because I, I think this is a good you know it's the push pull thing right and whether you're friends or not whether you're the ceo cro vp marketing vp sales whatever right we're going to have those moments where we where we piss each other off and, and I think the luxury you have is that you guys do know it's not personal, right? Yeah. You did play Little League together, right? What advice do you give to those companies that you're working with where you start to see that conflict between channels or silos or, or departments? Yeah, I mean, this is a big thing I did at Dine. I mean, I was a chief revenue officer and I ran all go to market, right? And right. one of the reasons for that was I... The company before I was at had very clear, bright lines, SaaS company in the ed tech space, uh, VP of marketing, VP of sales. They were both early employees. They were entrenched. They had their own points of view and there was always infighting and, and silos and issues created. So I've always talked about this as like ultimate, ultimate accountability between sales and marketing, whether that's a CRO or your CEO or, you know, uh, sales ops and marketing ops finance, you know, somebody's got to be the final call. Um, when it gets to the infighting and the sort of spats that inevitably occur, especially in fast growth companies, I always talk about it as um, common goals and uh, clear lines of communication. And I think the problem is uh, if you avoid conflict or you avoid talking things out, uh, this stuff just manifests and gets bigger and more disruptive, right? Um, and so that's the that's the typical issue I see. It's not the original conflict. It's the conflict compounding because uh, you're not hitting things between the eyes. So you need to have a culture of that trust and a culture of that communication. So I want to go back to the CRO role, and then I want to go back into how you got it got into Oracle, um, how that what that process was like. Um, so you know the CRO and the whole revenue ops team. Um, has been, you know, sort of been percolating for about the last two or three years. And it's really hitting a stride this year. And I definitely think in 2021, right? Um, what are the pieces that you would give, you know, if people are thinking about, okay, we've got a VP of sales, we got a VP of marketing or, a, you know, a chief sales officer and a chief marketing officer. How do you bring that into your organization without... Yeah, overly ruffling the feathers of course somebody's right. going to get upset right like egos are involved we know that what advice do you give to those people who are thinking about making that move or are making that move it's kind of funny i mean i when i became a chief revenue officer I was, it was 2011 and there weren't many of us i think mark roberge was a good friend of mine at hubspot might have he might have actually got the title after me and I remember I even wrote a blog post back then that I just made up a title for myself because we were creating a C-suite. I was VP of sales and marketing beforehand, right? And we were growing so fast that we needed to hire people. And I knew I needed more, more of you, right? I needed more operational uh, sales management, sales ops, people to keep me on track, right? So when I kind of flash forward that we're almost like a decade later, and you're seeing this movement to revenue ops and, you know, more of a KPI, you know, aligned KPI strategy around SaaS scaling and SaaS metrics. I kind of chuckle because like, these are the things that have existed specifically in sales organizations and certainly specifically in finance organizations over the last half decade, right? Yeah. And I actually think one of the bigger problems I had in scaling dying was less consternation with like marketing. And, and like brand and demand gen and content marketing, I actually got in the most fights with finance, right? And I think that's actually shifted a lot because all of these companies now have benchmarks, there's books being written, there's podcasts like this. You can actually compare yourself to S1 filings on gap class expense, uh, you know, percentages as it relates to top line sales. Like 
all these things back in the day, like I don't remember having a, a universe of people to talk to or podcasts right. to listen to or books to read. Um, so my, my perspective now is the best companies, the most outlier growth companies, this is literally living at some individual at the top, whether it's CEO, CFO, CRO, CMO, uh, Kyle Acey, a friend of mine from Lessonly, yeah. uh, open view guy, Kyle's always talking about why aren't CMOs getting sales, right? And I'm like, well, I, I was a CMO. I just called myself a CRO. Like, it's kind of right. like, like, what's the difference? Like, I'm a brand guy, evangelist, you know, meets BD sales guy. Like, like it's kind of based on competency, right? Um, yeah. And then again, filling the gaps and filling the team. So, so, so what how, do you, how, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say how not to disrupt that is to, there's going to need to be an alpha, right? And I think, you know, the reality is, is based on the strengths of the organization, you have to have clear conversations about who's going to own revenue growth, right? And, and again, that can be a CMO, that can be a CEO, that can be a CSO. What is that? If, so, so let's, let's assume you're the CEO, right? And you're going to bring in a CRO and, you know, you're not the expert you are. <laughs> yeah. How do you explain that to the head of marketing that, hey, we're bringing in a CRO and they're going to come from a sales background and then flip it. Hey, we're going to bring in a CRO, Mr. or Mrs. VP of sales, and it's going to be someone from marketing. How do you navigate that conversation? Well, before I answer that specifically recently, and we're just getting our company off the ground, we've got ourselves chasing around 2 million ARR in our business on more of the service module side. Right. We charge monthly retainer. Recently, we had this internal fight over like who runs sales. And then like, I looked around the room and I'm like, oh, I'm the Sierra. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was like, oh my God. I'm like, that's me. I keep on like wondering why we're not closing more business and why we're not driving more pipe and how we're doing a crap job forecasting. And so I think sometimes, especially in startups, you need to look around the room and like look in the mirror and be like, oh, that's actually me, right? As it relates to the, like the, the point you just made over bringing on a sales background revenue leader or a marketing background revenue leader or, you know, layering uh, people who maybe don't have that muscle. Again, this to me, this all comes down to like clear lines of communication and really defining the different archetypes of heads of sales or heads of revenue, right? Um, that is something Mark Roberge has done an amazing job outlining the different archetypes of heads of sales. Like I was clearly, even back when I was 26 and joined Dine, I was obviously the entrepreneurial head of sales. Like it was so obvious, right? And then when I started to hire people, I hired the enterprise gunslinger. I hired the repeat VP as we got a little bit bigger. I hired the sales manager as my first hire after me, who was like the really, really good sales manager, forecast, process, pipeline management, you know, analytical type, right? So again, I think these are stages of growth. They're based upon the team you've got. Too many companies, this is why VP of sales tenures and VP of marketing tenures or CMO tenures are too short. Too oftentimes, you think you're going to get all those characteristics and all those archetypes in one human being. And this hey, is not going to happen. Never. And that's why you end up, that's why you always end up with VP of sales that last 18 months or 12 months. Like even in late stages of dying, we hired a, um, an SVP of sales. I had moved to like a chief strategy GM role. We hired an SVP of sales the board really wanted to hire who came from the oracles and the indecas and massive enterprise sales who's really really good at enterprise sales but we were a you know 10 grand a year arr win hundreds of deals right. a month type of inside sales model right bottoms up model and it was a complete mismatch bad yeah, fit. it's a role specific decision totally so i think you need to just clearly understand the architects it's the same thing i always say to startups like you don't know how many boards I sit on or investments we've made or, or, or investors I talk to who are like, that guy's just not a CEO. And I'm like, listen, that guy's a founder CEO. He's not a CEO. Like, like that's a different archetype. If you think What's about the, the higher- What is the difference between those two things, right? Because I, I even think to some extent, founder CEOs don't understand that themselves. And so maybe there's some advice that we could sort of give them around- there's not, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like, there's nothing no, wrong with it's being because, But it's, be, it's because they're getting shit on all the time about what they're not, right? And they're right. getting grilled in board meetings over what they're not. Like, if you want your founder CEO, CEO 
to be you know the PE guy that you'd bring in to operationalize something to scale and flip it to an EBITDA margin focused company. It's a totally different skill set than the founder CEO who's got the vision, who's got the uh, who knows where all the bodies are buried, who's got all the market relationships, who's got that entrepreneurial DNA, who's got the product strategy. That person might not be the perfect slick CEO who's been there, done that five times over. Right? right. And by the way, even if they have done that, and this is now their company and their baby from day zero, their their outlook on life and their outlook on their company is going to be a different type of CEO than someone who's hired in on a new stock option plan five years into that company or 10 years right. into that company. Right. It's just a different um, level of intrinsic uh, ownership and like philosophy. And again, that, that also speaks to like an early stage VP of sales who's on the founding team or an early stage CMO is on the founding team. Like they're not going to be the person who's operating at Drift or operating at HubSpot or operating at but, Gong, right? But why not? Now I'm going to come in and I'm going to defend Scott because he, he's, Scott is your, for whatever reason, Scott's become the zero to 25 million guy, right? He'll get you to 25 million. And I've seen it happen on several occasions where people come in, well, he's not going to be the guy to get him to a hundred million, which in fact is wrong. Yep. They bring in the person to get them to a hundred million and that person fails miserably because well, that's, that's what I was just going to say though. Like if you look at the CMOs or the heads of sales of the majority of these companies, like look at HubSpot's current head of sales or look at Zora's current head of sales and you look at them, they're actually from Salesforce or Adobe right. or right. They like it's the just pedigree. like, they hired yeah, they just hired the pedigree and the, in in the name and the, and their experience. It's again, it's, it's, I can't wait to get to the Oracle part because you had corporate survivors and you had entrepreneurs. Right. And it was like, so clear who wanted to like break glass, evolve the business, take it to the next generation, understood the existential crisis they were in. And then you had the people who were like, how do I get to my RSU vests? How do I survive? How do I bob and weave? Like, like you can't like be a, a loyalist to a team and an organization that big. You're a loyalist to yourself and that's a corporate survivor, right? Or an entrepreneur is like trying to get as many people in the boat as possible, trying to bring everybody with them, trying to protect people, trying to get people raises, trying to get people promotions, maybe sometimes even over promoting. And like, again, that's not how it is in Oracle. Like when I, when, I, when we got to the end of our run there after three years, after we sold the business, I mean, I was getting offered all these jobs, like jobs, random jobs, like run North American field marketing, run uh, uh, global digital demand generation, go run product strategy and, and move to corporate development. Like I was getting all these opportunities. I was like, hey, can I bring any of my team? Like, yeah, you can get like three of them, six of them, nine of them. I was like, you know, I can go do a startup and bring all of them. You know, everyone I need on my team, I can bring. So it's just a very different DNA and a very different mindset. And again, that mindset shifts all the time when companies get past the Scott skill set. I'm doing that in air quotes, Scott, if anyone's listening right. on Spotify or something. And that, I got that a lot, honestly. That was a big thing for me. And it's one of the motivations in the, I love the Count of Monte Cristo and the Benjamin scale by Bill Simmons. And like, I basically was the chief revenue officer till we were like 80 million in revenue at Dine. They sacred cowed me into like a chief strategy officer role with like BD and product strategy and corp dev smaller team. So I didn't leave. They hired all these heads of sales and heads of marketing who had been there, done that. And I wasn't the guy. And then guess what? When Oracle bought us, they were like, Kyle York, only named person in the, in the LOI has to sign an employment agreement and we're not closing a definitive agreement. Right. And then I had the GM, the business and run it. And we've scaled that thing to greater heights. And I ran the business when everyone said I couldn't be a public company CEO or a public right. company head of sales. Right. So it's all a joke. So let's, so let's go dive into that for the next few minutes. Um, let, let's turn around and, and say, so you started this other company, right? Uh, what was it before Oracle? What was the name of it? It was called Dine. Dine. So I actually, I actually joined Dine. I was hired in, um, but yes, very early. I like and, to not lie. I wasn't a co-founder, but. Right. And you took it from where to where? Three to a hundred. Three to a hundred. What are the things that you learned? Let's let's say as you went from zero to ten, I think people kind of get. Let's let's go from twenty to fifty. What are the things that you had to learn that you didn't know going from twenty to fifty million? If you can think about it that specifically. Yeah, no, I think I can actually. So, because um, we had this um, 
CFO consultant who came in, a guy named Rick Dare from Gomez. Do you remember the web monitoring company? I think they yeah. sold the CompuWare. Yeah. He's a CFO of, CFO of Gomez. He came in, he's a consultant for us, and he asked me a very simple question. He says, are you lead constrained or are you feet constrained? And he forced me to get more sophisticated about quota modeling and sales org structure and cost of sales. And, you know, I guess back then LTV to CAC ratio, but it was more around cost of sales. And, you know, basically like you can't pay someone 200 grand if their quota is 400 grand, right? Uh, you're going to have ramp. You're going to have uh, sales rep churn. You're going to have, um, you know, quota. Uh, you're going to have quota misses. You're going to have all these different things. So really getting sophisticated about uh, financially modeling out uh, bottoms up quota models. Um, I'd say that was the number one thing that I was like, oh my God, because the amount of people you need to add an incremental ARR of 15 million versus an incremental ARR of 10 million is very different when you're, even if you're maintaining your churn rate in the SaaS business, right? Because right? so, so that was the biggest thing I'd say I'd take away was really that sort of end to end funnel, as well as marrying my planning to more of a financial uh, quota modeling planning, as opposed to like, oh, I'm just going to get the 10 million because I'm going to go win this many more deals you, and it become more systematic. And should, it, you know, in hindsight, right, do you, do you wish, gosh, I wish I'd known that when we were at 10 million or did you really, yeah. need, or do you, were you really still in the land grab mode of you know, the first 10 million is like land grab, right? Like we just take it, we get it, we get the logos, we do it. And then we try to get a little smarter. At least that's what I experience. Yeah, um, I'd say for, for us, it was interesting because, um, the first 10 million was all outbound. Like we, we were kind of creating a category. No one paid for the stuff that we sold. Uh, we were convincing customers to pay for it. We are building that foundational element. And then the moment we had all the lighthouse customers and the repeatable use cases and the semblance of a go-to-market organization, the inbound just took hold for us from call it 10 to hundred, right? And so that became far more systematic. With the startups we work with now, we're actually more telling them like, hey, when you get to like the 2 million-ish ARR, needing to go to four to five to six, um, that's when you really need to start getting more sophisticated and getting out of founder-led, executive-led sales. And that's a really, really hard uh, thing for them to model out. And, and typically the reason it's so hard to model out at those earlier stages is because the amount of sales reps you need and the BDR support you need and the demand gen programs you need to double revenue uh, in those earlier days, you actually need to start making those hires, individual people, like not, not dozens of people, but like individual sellers with a half a million quota, you need to start making, you know, seven, nine months ahead of next year's plan. So they're fully ramped and onboarded and contributing for a full calendar year. This is the most tricky thing in that stage that you're referring to that I don't think companies do very well. It's, it's less about like 2021's revenue right now. It's like you have no chance in hell at 2022's if you don't get a plan to get foundationally built for 2022. Does that make sense? It, do, it does. So then what happens now I'm looking at the other side. So, you know, we go in, you know, Kyle was so nice. He wrote us a nice, you know, a nice high six figure check, right? Um, <laughs> yep. You know, 800, 900,000. And I'm trying to do that. But then also the next thing I know is, you know, three months later, you know, is Kyle going to turn around and go, Richard, you just hired, you know, Scott to be your, your, your AE and he's been there three months. Why isn't he producing revenue? Right. Well, I, Kyle doesn't do that, but Kyle's counterparts in venture capital do because the majority of venture capital, as you know, have never worked a day or in you or my shoes. Right. And so I actually think that if the, the core differentiation of York IE, what we're trying to build is to reshape the way startups are built, scaled and monetized for the entrepreneur. Right. right. Like like the entrepreneur is a lonely world. I mean, we just put out an ebook last week called Surviving the Startup with stories of 22 founders and executive coaches and professors and psychologists talking about how to deal with mental health and burnout. Right. Yeah. Like, these are taboo topics. Right. Like these are not things discussed. I mean, there was a time at Dime where I was laying on MRI tables thinking I had cancer in my brain because I was so damn stressed out and I felt the weight of the company and the world on my shoulders, right? Yeah, so I've been, I've, I've been preaching and sharing my own mental health struggles for the last couple of years. So I'm glad to see it's it's coming out more and more. And I appreciate you. Where can people, what was that called again? Just so people want to hear it. Yeah, it's uh, called Sur Surviving the Startup and at York IE slash resources, you can download it. It's free. Um, there's a few other ones in there that you might like to. 
Cool. Um, so you built this company, right? And all of a sudden Oracle comes and knocks on the door, right? Now, did you guys go out seeking acquisition or did they come knocking on the door? So our founding CEO, Jeremy, who I was very close with, he was actually a high school, um, high school classmate, I would say, um, actually uh, left the company early in 2016. And our executive chairman's kind of stepped in as an interim CEO. And, you know, they were going to do a CEO search. We had actually just raised a um, private equity round of 50 million bucks. So we were well capitalized. And I basically went to him and I just said, listen, um, I don't think you guys realize how uh, valuable of an asset we have and how strategic we are to the market. Like if you looked across our partnerships, our customers, you know, it was the AWS's, it was the Microsoft, it was the Google's, it was the Akamai's, the Citrix, right. the laundry list, right? And these guys paid us a lot of money because we were the best in the world at this niche domain name system, DNS uh, platform product. And so, so I said, let, let Joe and I, who's my partner at York IE, ran Corp Dev. I said, let Joe and I go test the market give us three months, we'll come back and we'll tell you if anyone's interested. And we came up with just a laundry list of interests, right? And so much interest that we were like accelerating conversations in the shadows of the investors in the shadows of the board. Right. And we had no investment bank, anything. So anyway, we ended up accelerating that process. Jim couldn't believe it. Uh, one time we were at a meeting in New York actually uh, with a th three letter massive uh, legacy tech player. And we actually did a call with Oracle from their offices after our pitch meeting to them. Uh, and, you know, in that meeting, Jim was just like, Jim Baum was our chairman. He's from Indeca, the Tisa, PTC fame. Um, Jim was like, holy cow, let's sell this thing. We can get a big number for it. And so it's we time. basically ran the, we ran the process all the way to term sheet LOI. And um, we did end up bringing on Goldman, but it was after we had the LOI, we aggressively discounted that down. But that was more to spar with Doug Keering and the corporate development team at Oracle because he's like a he's a giant in, in Silicon Valley and he's been doing it 25 years and we wanted to keep him honest and Goldman give us some muscle for that. So you, you mentioned earlier too that you reported directly into Larry Ellison, right? Yeah, I, so I originally I reported to Thomas Curry and he's now Google okay. Cloud CEO. And then I reported to and Thomas reported to Larry and then I reported to Don who reported to Larry, Don Johnson, who still what, runs. What's Oracle it Cloud. like? Like, what's it like to go from you're running your own business for, and you get you get acquired by this amazing icon, right, of Oracle. And then you have, you know, the one of the Zeus's, right? One of the, you know, of, of all tech founders, yep. right? Is it intimidating? Is it scary? Do you kind of go, yeah, it's scary, but you know what? They actually do turn out to just be a human being, like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I think you get you get intimidated and you get awestruck. I mean, that's an honest statement, right? Even Thomas, I was just like, Thomas is like robotic. He's just a machine, right? The guy works, works, works. Um, Larry was different. I mean, his stage of life, he has like a different work style. Like, you know, right. he, he Tuesday afternoons at, after 2.30, you just got to be ready, you know, to join a call or jump in. If it's in person, you have to be there. And you get a 15-minute notice on email and then you got to hustle to the uh, to the meeting, right? So you just you just learn the work styles. They're eccentric. They're unique. You know, people don't get to that level unless they're you know pretty pretty legit uh, and and unique, right? And have a different work style. But once you, you beat that down, and you yeah, what are the kinds of things you can learn from somebody like that? Like like wow, you know, I never, you know, and I don't mean sort of managing the corporate political spectrum, right? But you look at those leaders, right? Because we don't get a lot of vision into it other than whatever book they write. So it's their right. own revisionist history. Yeah. Um, what kind of things were you like, oh, wow, that was kind of cool. I never, I never saw it that way. The one thing with Larry that was fascinating to me, and you'd have to be patient on this sometimes, but he, he's like a historian of um, tech and the tech industry forever and sort of like all the sort of ebbs and flows in it and all the trends and connecting like historical trends to current day trends and how they're no different mainframes, no different than cloud. Like, you know, and being able to sort of like juxtapose how that played out versus how it might play out now. I mean, Larry famously um, thought cloud computing was stupid. Remember? Back I remember. Yeah, I wasn't going right? to say it. So. I mean, he was pissy because, you know, um, Workday should have been, you know, uh, inside Oracle, NetSuite like, should yeah, have been. I mean, 
yeah. Salesforce should have been, Exact Target should have been. I mean, all these companies should have been. I mean, Larry was a 40 something percent owner of NetSuite, so that was cheating. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, he, he's embraced it. And his big thing now is it's like an existential crisis for Oracle. What used to be an on-premise da database with a bunch of like financial and HR and SaaS technologies around it um, now uh, isn't going to be on-premise. It's going to be in the cloud. And there's a shared accountability to security, availability, reliability, trust that Oracle is actually pretty uniquely positioned around given that their first customer in history was the CIA. Right? right. So that's why they're so hardcore aggressive in like regulated industries, government, like stuff that's not certainly like I was selling Angry Birds and Twitter and Netflix and Airbnb at die. Right. So it's just a different, a different game. So I think the biggest takeaway was like the enterprise uh, regulatory policy, like Oracle's like um, a country, you know, it's like, it's just like, it's so big and, you know, understanding like, the patience and, and that it's like a long game, like longevity play on the shift um, was just something for a startup guy who's like, sooner is better than perfect, high urgency, pace, um, win a deal at, you know, right now, I don't care. I mean, when we signed Oracle at Dime, they paid us 600 bucks a month. When they acquired us, they paid us 950 grand a year. And right. that was over a six year run. It was land and expand. That's the model I know, that's the model I love. And you know, they were like, what are you doing? Like, no, we only work, chase million dollar deals. Why are you even bothering with, and again, it, it's a different way to build a business. Obviously, it's a massive business in a transformation. But those right. are the types of things that I just I learned so much about, like enterprise selling, big companies, um, corporate structure, governance, uh, just, that, just stuff in that, a startup that you don't pay attention to. Yeah, I think to. that going from to be there during the on-prem to cloud is huge, right? Like, like, like that is because, I, I mean, it's not even game changing. It's universe like the universe well, and people don't understand the numbers like oracle might be in you know you you decide three to six place in the cloud platform game right. they're doing billions and billions of dollars of revenue like like so it's like here we are as a startup guy i'm thinking like i would kill for like 10 percent of that right. revenue coming right. my direction right? And, right and so i think i mean my job there basically was to take i had six different acquisitions that they kept tucking all the GTM people and the product people and the strategy people and the corporate dev people. And we lived in engineering, right? With all these people. And my job was to basically turn them all into cruise missiles or the samurai warriors I talked about earlier to help accelerate Oracle's position in cloud. And so reporting directly to Thomas and Don, basically they would just give me all these projects, all these M&A targets, uh, all these internal collaborations. I mean, I did so much internal selling to like the field at Oracle internal training on so many stages. I mean, I was speaking in front of 10,000 people at Oracle Open World, like pitching them on the future of Oracle. And, and Oracle looked at me as, a, I believe, like, and we were playing each other, but they looked at me as like a modern, young, you know, ambitious right. evangelist who could help them redefine themselves towards the future. And, and one time, I, well, last story I wanted to tell on Larry, they hosted a startup event right after we were acquired at, uh, at, in San Francisco. And it was at Larry's um, San Francisco residence that he's like never slept at. It was like a art museum. You had the two rules were no pictures of the art and no sneakers. You had to wear slippers they gave you when you walked in. And I was able to talk to Larry. I asked him a question. It was the first time I met him in person. And I said, hey, I came from Dine. You just acquired it. I, said, oh, I love you guys. Love the acquisition. Great deal. So happy you're here. And I said, hey, I'm only a few months in, but I'm really struggling with like, you know, should I break glass? Should I be a startup guy? Should I go try to conquer that mountain or do you want me to like fall in line and rest and vest? And I asked him in front of all these Oracle uh, for startups program members and other acquire. And he said, this company was founded by an entrepreneur. It may have been before you were born is before I was born. Um, he's like, but it was founded by an entrepreneur for us to make this transition to cloud. We need more entrepreneurs. Uh, he, he pointed to Evan Goldberg from NetSuite. He pointed to Eric Rosa from uh, the Oracle Data Cloud, who now runs CrossFit, by the way. Um, and we started running through all these people. And he's like, I need guys like you, gals like you, to come in and really make a dent. And, and otherwise, we won't make the transition happen. So right. again, that's why we ended up enjoying the three-year run, uh, learning a lot. It was like better than any MBA you could ever get, right? Um, and you know, practically, we stole a lot of that uh, deal analysis, you know, uh, corporate development strategy. And we, we do that now in our 
early stage investment firm. And then we also are really good at using our M&A muscle with our portfolio to say, here's how we're going to help you get acquired someday. And here's how you need to look and shape and feel and how you need to fit into the thesis of these larger strategics, whether it's a strategic PE or strategic um, corporate. That's awesome. All right. I got, I got two more questions um, before I get to them, though. Again, a shout out to our sponsors of Findem, Lead411, Vidyard, Gong, and Perception Predict. But one question coming all the way out of the Oracle thing. A startup is pitching you, right? They want you to invest in them. What's the biggest mistake they make? <laughs> oh, man. Um, that's a great question. The biggest mistake I think we see a lot is the name dropping. Uh, <laughs> it is unbelievable how uh, much name dropping goes into. I mean, logos like showing the logo salad, or no, you- not the logos. Like talking about the other investors or who their advisors are, or who they might hire someday. Yeah, and it could be here's our prospects because you know most really good investors, if they put themselves in the operator's shoes. In, in this day and age with COVID, when you're not meeting people face to face, you're doing a lot of back channeling really quickly, you know, and our networks are broad, right? Your network's broad, my network's broad. I can basically get intel on anybody. And the amount of times that startups sort of name drop people that might be investors or people that might be looking at their deal or partnerships they might make or their their prospect list, and all of a sudden they make a call or two and they're like, no, I mean, no, you joined a webinar with them. We're not interested or no, like, you know, we told them to call us back when they're at a million ARR. They just, they, right. you know, like, and it's like, so like, it's, it's, it's about honesty and it's about like, like truth seeking from our side. And I, I think that's a, it's just an integrity thing. And I think sometimes people try to like oversell or over pitch or over puff up their peacock feathers. And, and I just, you need to do that to some degree, but it always needs to be anchored in reality. So that's the most recent thing I'd say is a, is a piece of feedback I'd give. That's great. That's great. So our, our last question for everybody is, you know, how can we help you? What can, what can we do to support you? Is there a question, you know, you'd like to ask us about anything in the business or, um, you know, what can we do? If there are cause you're supporting, you want to make sure, you know, we give a cause out. Like it's. Yeah, no, I'd, lo- I'd love to get your perspective. I mean, you guys work with so many companies, you host so many great sales leaders on your podcast. Like, you know, you talked a little bit about that revenue ops, but I'd love to get your perspective on the sales tech landscape because it's actually been an area that is become just as cluttered as Martech uh, was five years ago. Yeah. And we as investors, like have almost got ourselves to the level where we're like, there's so much noise. We don't even like look at sales tech from an yeah. investment perspective. So I'd love your you know, quick read on the overall sales tech landscape. So I think it's necessary evil. Um, if you're not careful, all the technology will only accelerate the suck right? You will not, the human to human relationship is important. Um, there's a woman, I'm actually looked, pulled it up because I'm actually having this online discussion on LinkedIn with Mary Shea um, at Forrester. She wrote this really nice article about how uh, very specifically that, you know, the technical skills seems to be what sales leaders are hiring for more, not the communication skills and objection handling. And, you know, it, it as I've interpreted the article, it sounds like she's agreeing with it. And I'm like, no, like that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Right. Like you can train that stuff. Yeah. I can train, I can train the tech. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and she talks about, well, this is what sales leaders are looking for in the interviewing process. And I'm like, yeah, most sales leaders suck at hiring. Like, so do most HR people. They suck at hiring salespeople. They don't know. No, they, my 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 question though is a little bit more of like the sales tech tools. The so gongs, the tech tools the itself, um, It so seems the tech, like there's so many little niche things, and it's yeah, hard so, to cut through. Yeah, so I mean, look, you you absolutely need a a sales loft outreach, vanilla soft groove kind of program. Uh, CRM, obviously, um, video is obviously the next big thing, right? Um, with Vidyard and Boom Boom, you know, or Bomb Bomb, but Vidyard's sponsoring us, so we you know we support them. <laughs> Um, and I think those things are all, you know, LinkedIn sales navigator. I think the, the important thing that most companies have to understand is that these are table stakes, not nice to haves, right? Yeah. A nice to have for some might be Grammarly, right? right. Like I, yeah. but for me, that's table stakes because I'm a terrible writer. Yeah. So, um, so I think there's a proliferation of it. There's a ton of it out there, which does make it better for all of us, but we have to really understand what the human capacity is for being able to absorb and execute on them. Yeah. Right? Um, Do you think there'll be lots of consolidation? As I, it mean, well, to, I mean, 
I mean, we've been talking about this for three or four years with, with some of my friends, you know, like Mac, I don't know if you know Max Altschuler um, from sales. Not, not personally, I follow him. Yeah. So I'd love to meet him. Yeah. He, he has a real, he has a much stronger take on this, I think too. Um, Cause he, that's how he built sales hacker. But totally. yes, I think consolidation is going to happen. I would have thought more consolidation would have happened this year um, yeah, just because right. of COVID, um, but it may be delayed until next year. Um, I also think it's kind of depends on the one thing I'm seeing for the bigger companies, right? For the Oracles and the sales law and for the Salesforce and Microsoft, it kind of becomes this build versus buy, totally. they, right? And, and so it's like, which I think they should buy. The problem is, and I think, I don't know how, I mean, at Oracle, it worked well for you, but Salesforce has a little bit of a history of buying stuff and then not really engaging it the right way. Um, well, I think they, Oracle does a good, Oracle with us and the down the stack right. does a good job at integrating the IP. Right. Um, hard, tricky time with the business side. Mm -hmm. On the, on the, on the up the stack stuff, Oracle ha, has a hard, it's easier for them to um, integrate the go to market. And it's really hard for them to integrate the IP. Um, yeah. And that's why I think you've even seen the Oracle slow down a little bit on this to get their house in order and this cloud yeah. migration. So yeah, yeah that, it's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're. I think the question though is, it's not so much about the consolidation. It's just about the number of platforms someone can use. Right. right? Yeah. So it's it's like I can't have that many windows open, right? And granted, I'm Gen X, right? So I'm not digitally native like others, um, and so it, it's a little bit harder for me. I I, I assume it's generational. It's probably also my ADHD, my legit ADHD. Um, but I think as you can it's also get, workflow though, right? I mean, you can't yeah, so do like workflow, seven workflows you, you in your right, bed. Right. It's a fit into your workflow, right? Yeah. So it'll be interesting because I think, you know, sales off and outreach have started to make some, some acquisitions along the way um, that at that stage of their organization, those are those kinds of acquisitions they should be making on the text to the IP side, totally. right? To make yep. their thing better, which I like. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the video element. Right. Like, I yeah, think completely. the next piece that needs to be, you know, sort of acquired um, and whether it'll go, you know, if, if some of the, the main engagement platforms will build their own or buy one or if, you know, the bigger companies like, you know, Microsoft or for Dynamics or Salesforce or Oracle sort of skips over them and just buys the video stuff. Right. Because maybe it's still too it's cheaper. Maybe you know, yeah, less. I'm a, I'm on the board and an investor for a company called Cloud App, which is a competitor with Loom. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not straight sales tech, but a mm -hmm. lot of the use case is customer support, yeah. sales engagement. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, a lot of the kind of it, it is an interesting way you've seen Drift build the same thing. Vidyard has the same sort of thing. They're like building it into their stack. So it'll just be interesting how that plays out. Well, that's my perspective. Thank you for sharing. I was curious. Yeah, what, what, is that. what do you think? Like, what made you even I, ask the question? <laughs> Well, it's because we get a lot of inbound on investment for it, or even consulting or advisory to help them grow. And, you know, it's just, it's like, it's product, it's feature product platform discussion, right? And in our internal team, our deal analysis team, who looks at, you know, thousands of deals a year, right, is like really struggling with cutting through the noise of what is a good sales tech investment, because there just seems to be so much fragmentation and so many point solutions or like features uh, that won't become big companies. And another company I was on the board of was called Datanize. You might remember they're like- I know that, yeah, I did some work with them. Yeah. Yeah, so Ben Sardella, Ilya, um, yeah. you know, they sold, I was on the board as a founding investor on that and and they sold the Zoom info, but like they kind of plateaued at like a 10 million ARR. Right. And it was kind of like, it's nice to have, but when they got boxed out of like some LinkedIn and Salesforce integrations, it yep. became impossible to scale. And so. I just have like some of this like swirling in my brain and it's led us to sort of like, oh, it's sales tech. Let's not look at it. But I know that's stupid, yeah. um, but I just so can't. The, so maybe if you could, get, I'd love to keep an engagement with you guys. Yeah. And then, you know, if you could introduce me to Max too, I'd love to pick his brain on this because I don't think we should be just blowing it off. Uh, yeah. the way that this we is, So this are. is the one thing that I would ask every single one of those players who are asking is to say, what's the one thing that makes you better? Yeah. And not better than, I just want to hear better because I yeah, want to right. see where their answer goes. That's and, back to the, what they execute on now and the vision of where it's back to what we talked about earlier. It's like, yeah. it's like, maybe that's the problem. So many of them are in this like execution phase of this like early stage and how they carve out a little spot for themselves yeah. versus where's that go if they unlock 
the next sequence of their growth. And, and, a, and a different version of that question is to say, okay, so let's say I give you 2 million, 3 million, 10 million. What's going to make you fail? What's the one thing that'll make you fail? And yeah. if they can't figure out that, then that tells me whether or not I think they're the right kind of person. Because I think you know as well as anybody, yeah. oftentimes you're, you're investing in the person. Totally. Because if they're going to yeah. pivot, you're like, all right, well, if this doesn't work, I trust them. They're going to figure out something else. Right? Completely. So, um, but this has been awesome. awesome. Like, I can't believe we went, we went a little bit over an hour. So um, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> thank you, man. I really appreciate it. And by all means, yes, let's definitely stay in touch. And I'll, I'll certainly work that, that intro to you. But awesome. uh, it's been a lot of fun, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Hope you enjoyed the perspective. No worries. No, it was really good. Thank you.